Uh, yeah, this instrument is a, a da Silva, so made by Michael da Silva in uh, Berkeley, California. It's the first of its kind with this um, unique cutaway, which you can see is more of sort of a tilt away, <laughs> if you can call it that, um, so that you preserve the the volume of the body, uh, but so that you can play up on the neck a little more easily. So that was a new idea. Um, Mike makes, I think, the best ukuleles in the world right now. Um, it's extremely light. This is really important. It's, it's for a tenor. I mean, I wish you could feel it. Uh, it's, it's very, very light, like a feather, um, partly because it has the active uh, my side pickup that has no battery, even though it's got a very powerful sound. Um, it charges uh, with a charger that plugs into the wall, and you charge the, the uh, capacitor inside, and it uh, lasts for hours and hours and hours on that charge. So you don't have to have a battery, which makes it heavier. And then these are the, 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 new, the newest thing, these peg heads, which uh, look like old-fashioned um, friction tuners, but they're anything but. Um, they are geared through the middle so that um, only the end bit move, moves. This piece does not move. They're extremely smooth, uh, they're very accurate, and they're extremely light. And they look cool. <laughs> so this, that keeps this instrument very light and very loud. Spruce top, Koa back and sides. So for me, this is like my ideal, my ideal instrument. Would you like to hear some ukulele hip hop? <laughs> okay, so a little bit, just a sample of ukulele hip hop. Come <laughs> some. That one has two major differences to this one. That one has a has pick guards on the front, so that when I'm using the uh, the chopsticks, it doesn't uh, scrape the wood or the or the varnish. I would never use the chopsticks on this instrument because it would destroy it. Um, the other instrument also has a, a Fishman uh, blender, a pro blend pickup, which means that the pickup system is not only in the saddle. Um, but it also has a microphone inside, which means that when you when you tap on the outside of the instrument, that is also picked up and sent to the amplifier. Uh, whereas in this case, this just has an undersaddle pickup, and when you tap on the body, that will not be transmitted. So in order to do some of those more uh, you know, esoteric percussion pieces that I like to do, I really need a, a, a particular uh, brand of pickup. I wish to the Lord that train would come. I wish to the Lord that train would come. I wish to the Lord that train would come. I think it's uh, all started with the internet. I think uh, every time, every time there's a new way of communicating, the ukulele seems to become very popular. So um, you know, we had it in the 1910s and 20s with the radio started spreading the word, connecting people through music. TV did the same thing in movies. You know, the 50s and 60s. Look at Arthur Godfrey with his uh, television show where he taught ukulele. And then there's the, the third wave, which is, you know, largely fueled by the internet. So every time we have this new way of connecting with one another, the ukulele seems to become popular. Um, I also think that <laughs> the ukulele has a way of, um, of, I don't know how you would say it, flaming out, becoming too big for its own good. And it'll, it'll, it'll rise, it'll rise, it'll become really big, and then it will fall. And, uh, and then we forget about the ukulele for a generation. And then 
we remember again. And I think we're, we're just in a period of remembering now. Of, of we remember how fun and simple and honest the ukulele is. And we go through the process of rediscovering the instrument. I started at school <clears throat> when I was, I was eight years old. And uh, we were given ukuleles uh, in, in the classroom and we were taught to play. It was a very normal thing at the school that I went to. It wasn't, uh, it didn't seem weird or out of the ordinary. It uh, was something that everybody did. All my friends played the ukulele. And so for a long time, I thought that everybody in the world learned ukulele at school. I thought this was just standard. Uh, it took a long time for me to discover that this was not true. Not even in Canada, but of course in a lot of schools in Canada, they do teach the ukulele. But uh, even throughout Canada, it's uh, patchy. You know, not, not every school gets an ukulele program by any means. So, um, so I discovered then that you know, we were just really lucky that we had grown up in a place where they believed in the ukulele as the best way to teach music to young people. It takes a person who believes, a person with a vision for music education and a person who understands the value of the ukulele. And that person in Canada was, uh, was Chalmers Doan, who was uh, born in Halifax and worked in, in the Halifax School Board. And uh, he recognized in the 60s that the ukulele was the ideal instrument for young people to learn. I've, I've been playing for over 20 years and I used to play every day for two hours. That was my regime. I used to have a two hour practice uh, session every day. Um, nowadays I play uh, when I feel like playing. I, I think I play mostly for fun now and, and, and I play, I practice when I get in, in, excited about a skill or a song um, and so that's the great luxury of, of being at a place where you feel comfortable with uh, with the technique that you have I, uh, I don't think that you need to practice for 10 hours a day you know people say they practice for 10 or 12 hours a day I think that probably means that they're not being very the ukulele scene in France reminds me a little bit of the ukulele scene in uh, Italy and also the ukulele scene in New Zealand because in these these places, it's the, the ukulele uh, community is really being uh, led by young people, uh, uh, people who are full of energy and full of new ideas, and uh, they're very fashionable and stylish, you know. Um, uh, in other places, uh, the ukulele is being uh, revived by older people who remember the ukulele the way it was, but who don't necessarily have an interest in creating something new with the ukulele. Right. So the, the great challenge with this third wave is that we somehow make it different from the first and second wave. to a, a performance, which is usually where people buy CDs now, not so much in the stores, but at concerts, they just want to, they just want to leave with a, a piece of the artist, you know, and that's why they buy a CD. They could just as easily go online now and buy it, you know, download it, but people want, people still want some uh, something more than that, I find, which is why, you know, the CD business is still thriving, people are still making physical CDs all the time, even though there's all this download stuff. I mean, the record label that I'm with has even suggested that I do, uh, uh, that I release my new album on record, on LP, mm -hmm. as well as CD. 
because that's even more tangible. It's even more real. You know, people. So, so you know, the, people do get tired of all the virtual reality, and then I think they, for a long time, for many years to come, there's going to be a place for this uh, physical product, even though it's maybe less convenient and maybe old-fashioned. But I think you're going to see CDs and LPs around for many years to come. I have never actually put a video on YouTube myself. Not even one. All the videos that are there have been other people who, you know, come to a concert and, and record it and then put it up online and, you know, that's just the way it goes. I, I've never... Don't write to me. Not the one about the, the Riddle Canal. Uh, I put that on my website. Yeah. And then somebody took that video and put it on YouTube. Um, yeah, so that that's true. That was one that I actually pre uh, taped myself. Mm. Um, and then I posted that on my website as a download file. I didn't even know what YouTube was at that time. So, nobody really knows what YouTube is. It's, a very, it's, it's still unknown. It's still unknown how it changes the relationship between the audience and the performer and the work. Like who owns the work? Who owns the rights to that work? Who says what can be done with the work? These are, these are big questions. They've always been big questions, but YouTube makes it even more confusing. And, and I, I really don't have the answer. <laughs> mm. <laughs>